Good evening, friends. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar uh, on the launch of the IIS guidelines and the discussion on the topic arbitration as the new normal. I have with me very distinguished panelists. Uh, they actually need no introduction, but just as a formality, let me go through the uh, process of introductions. Uh, firstly, we have Justice Ravindran, the former judge of the Supreme Court of India. He enrolled as an advocate in the year 1968, became the High Court uh, Judge of uh, the Karnataka High Court in 1993. Uh, was elevated as the Chief Justice of the Madhya Pradesh High Court in 2004, uh, joined the Supreme Court in 2005, and retired in the year 2011. If I may just add a little bit of touch to a personal touch to uh, my introduction of Justice Ravindran, I, I can safely say, and I'm sure a lot of uh, other practitioners would agree, that he's probably one of the best arbitrators that you can find in the country, a person with excellent legal and commercial acumen. And if you're appearing before him, you would always dread the fact that he would pick on that one document or that one line which is going against you. So we're very, very happy to have you with us, sir. And we look forward to having a good and healthy discussion and uh, thoughts from you. Uh, secondly, we have Mr. Uday Holla, uh, senior counsel and uh, former advocate general <clears throat> government of Karnataka. In fact, he's been the advocate general for the government of Karnataka four times. He enrolled in the year 1973, and he has a rich experience of more than four decades. Uh, Mr. Hulla, uh, I can safely say on behalf of all the practitioners here that uh, you continue to be an inspiration for a lot of us. We all look up to you for the manner in which the profession ought to be conducted. We are extremely delighted to have you with amongst us. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. K.G. Raghavan, also a designated senior counsel. Uh, he enrolled in the year 1976. Uh, with Mr. K.G. Raghavan, of course, I have a lot more personal connection in that sense. I, I was his former junior, and I can also safely say that uh, he's probably one of the best senior counsels that we have in the country today. A person with exceptional integrity, exceptional legal acumen, and above all, I think an exceptional mentor to all his juniors. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Raghavan, for joining us today, and we look forward to the discussions with you. <laughs> Next, we have... Next, we have uh, Ms. Sapna Jangiani. Uh, she's a partner with Clyde & Co. Singapore. Uh, she was recently uh, the appointed as a Queen's Counsel. She gained the silk for, uh, from England uh, for her excellence in advocacy. Uh, Sapna does a lot of international arbitration work. And I know that she has a very keen interest in so far as the Indian market is concerned. We see her regularly appearing in a lot of uh, the conferences in India. Thank you so much, Sapna, for being here. And we look forward to having you on the panel and having an engaging conversation. I now request uh, Vyapak Desai, who is one of the uh, founder members of the IAF, to give a background and an introduction of what the IAF is and the reason why we're having the discussions today. Thanks uh, a lot, Lomesh. And uh, I won't take much time considering I would like to hear the speakers that you just mentioned. But a uh, very quick introduction to IAF and IAF guidelines. So IF was, you know, originally conceptualized uh, somewhere in 2012-13. And at that time, the idea was to bring in some framework and some uh, support to the arbitration and the conduct of arbitration in India. So it was more like a practitioner's forum. Uh, and ultimately, you know, the objective is to form uh, an arbitration bar in India. Uh, and, and we are moving towards that. But as part of that journey, the first thing we thought was to streamline the conduct of arbitration in India. Uh, while we have institutional arbitrations, we have ad hoc arbitrations, we have our law, which got uh, amended uh, in 2015 and 2019. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the conduct of arbitration is always left to the arbitral tribunal and the parties, uh, even with the law and the rules of the institutions and more particularly when they are ad hoc arbitrations. So we thought that to get the procedures and the practice little more consistent and a uh, little bit foolproof when it goes to challenge for setting aside awards on the aspects of process, uh, we thought we should bring out some kind of a guidelines uh, for the tribunal and parties to follow. They are flexible. They are not mandatory. You can choose one. You can choose uh, a few of them, uh, but idea is to uh, bring in some kind of consistency in terms of the conduct of arbitration. Uh, what we did was we went through a five-step process to bring about these guidelines. First, of course, we looked at 
lot of international guidelines of conduct of arbitrations. We have IBA guidelines. We have all the institutions. We, in fact, took support from ICC, SIAC, uh, MCIA, AIAC. All the institutions are actually supporting us. So this is not in conflict with the rules, but it is only a supplement uh, for the purpose of conduct. Second, we, in fact, prepared a detailed questionnaire. Uh, bringing in the understanding and the gaps which are required from an Indian arbitration practice. Uh, then we actually conducted interviews with domestic and international practitioners, uh, you know, such as Jasbir Dilon QC, Rajesh Pillai QC, Mysore Prasanna, uh, Ketan Parekh, Nakul Diwan, Sharina Patit, and many more took their inputs. And then the drafting of the guidelines was conducted in association with the academic which is the GNLU, and we came up with the guidelines, which were then reviewed by the likes of Justice uh, B. N. Sri Krishna, A. P. Shah, and uh, many more, uh, you know, uh, legal luminaries. We launched these guidelines in 2018, but we didn't stop there. We, in fact, started immediately working on updating the guidelines, and this is where we are on the version two in 2020, and the people involved on the IAF side or both in terms of other uh, matters and also in terms of the guidelines uh, like Sahil Kanuga, Raj Pachmatya, Mustafa Motiwala, Tejas Karya, Shashanga, Renu Parik, uh, Nandini Khetan, Abhinav Bhushan, uh, Niti Sachdeva, all of the people from different law firms and different institutions have actually supported this initiative and that is where we launched these guidelines uh, a couple of uh, weeks back in one of such webinars. Uh, uh, it was an e-launch in a way, uh, but we want to now take these guidelines uh, to a larger uh, audience uh, and see that if the practice uh, is followed and some of the guidance is taken as part of the conduct of arbitration, we may see uh, much more consistent uh, awards and the process as arbitration, and also uh, less of uh, 34 uh, in terms of setting aside of awards only on the process. The remaining obviously remains as it is uh, based on the law and the rules uh, for which the arbitration is conducted. So with that uh, short introduction, uh, Lomesh, over to you, and I, I hope to have a great panel and I, I, I'm waiting to listen to everyone here on this. Thank you. I know a lot of hard work has gone into this, so congratulations to the entire IAF team on this. Uh, so without much wait, uh, let me just uh, direct the first question to Justice Ravindran. Uh, Justice Ravindran, uh, is COVID crisis really a watershed moment for arbitrations in India? Do you think that uh, you know, the changes that you're likely to see, is it just a knee-jerk reaction? Are people likely to forget this the moment the COVID crisis is over? Or do you think that this is something that's going to be a long-lasting effect, so to speak? What are your thoughts, sir? Sir, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it is uh, uh, certainly a turning point. There is uh, no doubt about it. And uh, it has brought out two important things. First is, it has shown the flexibility of arbitration when compared to court proceedings. This is the first thing. The second thing is, it has shown arbitrators as also the practitioners that things which they knew to be possible, but which they were not following, can be followed and are being followed. This is the most important thing. We knew that you know pleadings can be uploaded. We knew that documents could be uploaded. We knew that the preliminary hearing can be uh, uh, web hosted. We knew that uh, applications can be heard by video conferencing, but we were just not doing because the need never arose and people were going on meeting physical, having physical conferences and all that. No, it is shown that you know it is very competently you can conduct the arbitrations you know, by uh, uh, virtual hearings. And uh, I tell you that it is now proved that the first hearing, the um, hearing relating to case management and uh, the routine applications, and even the final hearing can be uh, conducted uh, um, by video conferencing. 
the only problem may be with evidence even that can be done and uh, uh, i am sure that things are going to change if you ask whether it is a knee jerk reaction or are we going back yes always when it when such things happen and things relax there is a tendency to go back but here some of some things are there to stay that is the use of zoom use of uh, web cisco webex use of um, what is it google uh, hangout or uh, google meet these are things that will stay and uh, old timers like us who were even afraid to touch a computer or we do, we wanted some assistance you see now we are comfortable in the sense you see that we know that we have nothing we need not do anything technical we have to just uh, go and join the meeting and everything is done i i i am sure that things are going to change and they are for the better and it is going to cut down the cost it is going to cut down the time and it is going to increase the efficiency these are the three areas you know the uh, there are going to be changes and uh, unless you keep up unless you keep up with the changes uh, you are out this is my feeling right thank you very much sir thanks yeah uh so maybe continuing with that train of thought and if i can now ask the question to mr uday holla in terms of what does this change actually mean for for practitioners for lawyers and counsel does it require a fundamental rethinking of the manner in which hearings are being approached or is it you know business as usual sir well firstly i'm sure many lawyers will now advise their clients to put in a clause in the arbitration agreement itself stating that the arbitration proceedings can be online with the use of the video conference and i am sure many parties also would like to do that for the simple reason it cuts down the cost enormously you know if you have an international arbitration if one has to travel to singapore or london it costs quite a bit and so this is one area i thought you know will be Uh, useful and parties also might insist on uh, such clauses being introduced in their arbitration agreement secondly yes there are certain problem areas like cross examination which i'm sure you know other panelists also would uh, agree with me the cross examination you know in person is different from cross examination online so one of the things is you know years back in fact uh, i remember 2003 karnataka high court was the first of the high courts which provided and permitted cross examination of witnesses through video conference in fact uh, the independence day was uh, 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 sued by a party in mysore a client a, a person in mysore stating that you know there is a infringement of copyright and the witnesses came from uh, us on behalf of 20th, 20th century fox they couldn't reach mysore ultimately an application was filed for uh, cross examination of those witnesses through cross examine through video conference which was rejected by the trial court but allowed by the high court subsequent to that there was uh, that was in january 2003 and 2000 uh, april 2003 supreme court also in a criminal matter permitted uh, cross examination i'm sure you know this is though most of the cross examiners would like to cross examine the witnesses in person because they will have more uh, 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 possibly you know as a cross examine i'll say they might have more nervousness if you know they are uh, <laughs> before the arbitrator in person than you know in a video conference but then you know these are things you know which are bound to happen and i'm sure this change is uh, welcome and as justice ravindran said it uh, reduces the cost it has taken away the fear of many of us that you know we are not tech savvy we will not be able to do this in fact just you know before the covid 19 uh, started we had a conference because some counsel from delhi couldn't come so we had uh, one conference where justice ravindran was a part of it he was one of the arbitrators and we had a, 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 a arguments on uh, video so these are the things i'm sure you know which are uh, bound to happen secondly the lawyers also will become tech savvy till now you know we were in fact i don't know you know at my age when i started my practice i'm sure you know many of you here are not we were you know on typewriter and any correction in it had to be 
again retyped once more and it was a horrendous task and all these computers have uh, reduced our work so much so also would be this in fact uh, uh, one other things you know the one thing that about uh, video conferences if it is recorded you know you can use it at any time and uh, in a cro cross examination you know you can start looking at the uh, 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 witness over and over again listen to him so these are the things i'm sure you know which are uh, 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 in the pipeline and it will be very useful i'm sure you know uh, miss jagatyani will have uh, more things to say because uh, of her international uh, more exposure to international practice than me though because i have hardly done a handful of international arbitration i'm sure being the youngest and uh, being the brightest she'll have more things to say about it Yeah, Sapna, your views on a sort of international perspective of things, please. Mr. Hollow is far too kind. Um, I think I probably only have three very short points to add. The first is that, in my experience, case management conferences and short hearings have been carried out um, in international arbitration, certainly outside India, for a long time. Um, when you have parties and counsel in different countries for a case management conference, or even I've had it for jurisdictional objections, um, it really isn't going to be cost effective or practical to have everybody in the same place. So it has been very common. I think the second point I would add is that my experience in India has in fact been very different. I've had the experience in India where counsel um, arbitrators and parties have had to all travel in from different places for a hearing uh, at the beginning of which we all knew there was going to be an application for an extension of time because new counsel were instructed for one party and there was no objection from the other party but there was still this insistence on having a hearing in person. Um, I don't think you actually needed a hearing at all for that case but I think that's just an example that my experience in India has been quite different and there has been much more of an emphasis on in-person hearings. I think the last short point I would make is that um, I do think that we're going to see a big sea change in terms of having more hearings virtually or by teleconference and not only will that be welcome in saving costs for parties but of course there is also a move internationally for our field of international arbitration to reduce its environmental footprint. So I think that if we do see this sea change, I do think it will be extremely welcome also in the fight for trying to help combat climate change. Thank you so much, Sapna. Uh, my next question is to Mr. K.G. Raghavan uh, and Mr. Udayvalla, uh, two seasoned practitioners. So uh, Mr. Udayvalla made the point about cross-examination uh, in a virtual world, so to speak. Uh, Mr. Raghav and Mr. Hola, how do you think that the art of cross-examination is going to change in the light of the fact that things may actually move to a virtual world in that sense? Uh, I have watched both of you cross-examine closely, and I know that there is a lot of emphasis on a personal interaction with the witness, understanding the body language, getting the cues from the arbitrator, understanding what the witness is saying, etc. Do you think anything is going to change in the virtual world? Uh, how, how do you foresee this to be? Uh, in fact, let me begin by uh, mentioning that a couple of months ago, in fact, we had an arbitration where Justice Ravindran was the sole arbitrator and uh, Vyapak was with me. And I think, Lomesh, you were also in that arbitration. And we did cross-examine a witness who was sitting in California. All that we had to do was to adjust the time. And I don't think any one of us felt dissatisfied or thought that anything which was not commensurate with judicial standards had at all taken place. If that did take place so efficiently, I do not see any reason why that cannot continue going forward. Possibly COVID-19 is just a catalyst to change our mindset. And when we go and analyze the three basic benefits of arbitration, namely saving of cost, time, and confidentiality. Now, cost and time is a major factor. 
And if we do resort to virtual hearings, I think we would have contributed towards the saving of cost and time. Now, what are the skills required for a cross-examining counsel is the question that you're putting to me. Apart from being tech savvy, let us take that for granted. But what is it that is required for cross-examining counsels to adapt to this virtual hearing scenario? I think first and foremost, I think we need to sharpen our skills of cross-examination. It can't be, if I may say so, rambling. We have to be pinpointed and bring focus to the point that we want to place before the other arbitrators. The another great benefit that I see, and one of the disadvantages that I see in cross-examining when a witness is there in person, is the unhealthy practice of witness being bullied by cross-examining counsels. This will stop. The cross-examining counsel, I think, will have to exhibit more decorum and decency in cross-examination. This will be a great advantage, according to me, of virtual hearings, and it will need for the cross-examining counsel to alter or improve upon his soft skills. This is my view of how technology is going to ensure that we do the cross-examination in a more effective and simpler way than by a personal cross-examination. Thank you very much, sir. Can I get, bring in uh, Mr. Uday Hulna? So you slightly disagree with Mr. Raghavan for the simple reason that when you have crucial witnesses, the body language, the eye contact, the way, you know, the, you know, in fact, even a shrug, if you remember, I, even a shrug, you know, conveys so much of meaning. So all that will be lost when you have cross-examination online. But then, you know, it's only in, in respect of crucial witnesses that we need to say that, well, you know, I want him, you know, in person. Otherwise, it can be done online. Yes, as uh, Shri, Mr. Raghavan rightly said, we will be precise even in arguments. I'm sure, you know, when you have uh, online arguments, you'll be, you'll be more uh, precise. You will be, uh, uh, you will shorten your uh, arguments. I'm sure, you know, these are the advantages. But as far as Cross-examination is concerned for crucial witnesses. I'm sure, you know, it is the, the, the personal presence of the witness makes a world of difference. Uh, right. Lomesh, can I come in yes. for a second here? Absolutely, sir. In fact, I was going to ask you a question, but thank you. Please. You see, one thing we should remember is we are arbitration means it is commercial disputes. We are not very much concerned with demeanor of the witness, the uh, answers being uh, given in a manner from which you can identify whether he is telling the lie or the truth. These are very crucial in criminal cases. And as uh, Mr. Holla said, in regard to certain crucial witnesses, it is very relevant. But most of the witnesses, they speak from records. In a commercial dispute, I have found in 50% of the uh, commercial disputes which I have uh, done by way of arbitration, when the arguments were addressed, not even a single line of the oral evidence was uh, referred. When everything is covered, when, how, can, how can the oral evidence uh, supersede uh, the documentary evidence? Therefore, the lot of cross-examination is done, yes, but ultimately the reference is to document. Therefore, while we realize that oral evidence may be required, if lawyers can change their mindset and decide in the beginning whether this case can be conducted only on documents and arguments, and only in unex exceptional cases, I will ask the witnesses to come. It is going to reduce the cost, it is going to reduce the time, and it is going to make arbitrations really successful. This two year or uh, even even with the amendment to the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, 
you know, uh, the, the arbitrations are not being completed within 18 months for the simple reason, a lot of witnesses are being tendered and they are being cross-examined and cross-examined and it takes a long time. But if there is some, you know, conscious effort on the part of the council to cut down the witnesses and restrict it to crucial witnesses, as Ola said, that is very relevant. There may be some witness whom you cannot dispense with. Those witnesses you examine, others you try to cut short. And another thing which they have completely lost sight of is the art of interrogatories. Why not you put interrogatories before the evidence? And 50% of the uh, cross-examination can, can be cut down. We have to totally adopt ourselves to new methods in arbitration. And the Arbitration Act gives you that power. It says we can, the parties, the lawyers, the arbitrators can set the entire procedure. Therefore, I think we can change and uh, the cross examination should not be uh, a stumbling block. But it has to be mentioned that unless both parties agrees, uh, agree, the witnesses cannot be uh, uh, cross examined on the uh, uh, conference, even though in some international uh, arbitrations, the tribunals have made orders that, in spite of the objection, they will uh, hold it. But it is better to avoid challenges to award, uh, awards that not to do it if it is objected. Their lawyers can play a very big role. They can persuade their clients and say, look here, yeah. there's nothing wrong. As you see, uh, Mr. Uh, Raghavan mentioned it. I remember, yes, Raghavan was there and Vyapak was there and Lomesh were there. And uh, of course, the witness was himself a counsel uh, and exceptionally good counsel. Therefore, uh, it went on exceptionally well. Uh, therefore, uh, it is possible that uh, it can be done. This is my feeling. Thank you. In fact, as, uh, I have one point. Yes, thank you. Ravindran said, if uh, by consent, you know, evidence can be recorded. Otherwise, if you have seen the recently, you know, in 2020, recently, you know, last month, Supreme Court passed an order based on, you know, in the light of COVID, that you know, online examination, I mean, online uh, arguments are permissible, but online cross-examination, they said, you know, will not be permissible. It is therefore relevant that you know parties, possibly you know, in the uh, very uh, uh, agreement, put that you know, cross-examination witnesses also are permissible, you know, through online video conference. Thank you very much, sir. Vikas, over to you. Yeah, sure. You know, thank you, sir. And I think you know that brings us. And I think uh, Justice Ravindran, you identified some of the uh, the key issues. But maybe if I can ask you to take it one step further and play devil's advocate, would arbitrators be comfortable conducting arbitrations entirely on a digital platform? And if not, what do you think are the major challenges that are likely to be faced? What are the major roadblocks? Uh, sir, I think you might be on mute. Uh, the, the first problem is technical glitches. You know, uh, in India, you know, you, there are power cuts, then this goes down or that goes down. That take, And if it is going to continue for five hours or six hours, there are bound to be some uh, technical glitches. If that is, uh, uh, you know, sorted out, I don't think that there should be uh, any objection for uh, uh, the uh, hearings. In fact, uh, I completed... Uh, uh, 10 days back, a regular hearing for three days, continuous days from morning to evening. It went on without any kind of uh, problems. Therefore, it is all in the mind. If you think that we can do it, yes, we can do it. If you think that, you know, yes, uh, physical hearing is necessary, physical hearing is necessary for various reasons. I do not want to go into it. Um, you see, the, that's why, you see, the lawyers should decide whether you want to complete it immediately you want to do it within a time frame or you want to drag it on therefore if you decide arbitrators will have to agree see the, the uh, i would say though ultimately the decision may be in the hands of the arbitrators in these matters of procedure what both councils say count why count that that will be the decision the arbitral tribunal normally will not say if both councils say this is what we want to do if uh, that sea changes should come among lawyers in India. It has come in international arbitrations. Uh, I'm sure uh, it will come here. It has started coming. That's what I would say. 
Thank you, Justice Ravindran. Uh, my next question is to Mr. Sir, there is one, uh, I just want to make one point. There is one distinct advantage in ha having uh, evidence recorded on a digital platform. What the witness says goes on record just as he says. When it is recorded on a face-to-face, uh, 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 -face, it invariably happens here because we don't have that facility of transcription as much as you have in Singapore, Sapna, and I'm sure you have the experience of arbitration in India too. The, what is recorded is not exactly the words used by the witness. But when it is on a digital platform, everything that the witness does can be recorded, including possibly if he coughs. That is one great advantage of having evidence recorded on a digital platform as opposed to evidence being recorded physically. If I may, um, yeah. just to say that um, I've had experience of um, arbitrations in India which, where I was very dissatisfied with the transcripts that came out. So the last arbitration in which I sat as an arbitrator in India, I actually insisted on having live transcribers who had to be flown in from abroad. But I wonder, and this is really a question for the panel, um, it's great to note that an advantage of an arbitration digital platform will be the recording of the transcript. But I just wonder as a question, since we're discussing the evolution of arbitration in India, whether we might see the development of live transcription because in my view it can greatly aid in arbitration and what I found um, in my experience was not satisfactory. Uh, Sapna maybe I will I will volunteer myself for this and give you the answer partly because I wear two hats one is an arbitration lawyer in Keystone and I also I'm a co-founder at Center for Online Dispute Resolution I was hoping to keep this to the end we have transcription in, in CODR that's available today in India. And, and we recognize the lacuna that you were talking about, but I think there's still, like you said, some hesitation by the arbitrators themselves and the council because they don't want everything they're saying to come on record. They want to have the flexibility to not have something on the record, to have question and answers in the format that they're comfortable with rather than it being a verbatim record of exactly the witness says. So I think the technology capabilities are coming and they're there already with us, but the acceptability is still quite low. Uh, let me uh, add a practical aspect. The Indian witnesses, uh, if you uh, record them in the manner in which the evidence is given without sanitizing them, it is going to be very, very difficult. It is edited because to make sense. The problem is, you see, many translate their local language thoughts into English and uh, it does not fit well. For a particularly for a person, international lawyer, if you see the kind of evidence that is being given, the, um, the, the, you will think, you know, the witness is evasive. He's not evasive. He's not comfortable. That's all. Therefore, uh, more and more what is done the questions are recorded, answers are recorded, they are edited. Well, it is not good. I am sure if we really do it on uh, uh, video conferencing, you can, uh, you know, uh, look at the demeanor, you can have a actual recording and, you know, it, it is available. I, I, I am told if it is Zoom or any such thing, the entire proceeding can be uh, recorded and it will be available to both sides. It is going to be a great advantage provided you know that uh, there is a little improvement in the way evidence is given by witnesses. Right, sir. Thank you so much for that. In fact, uh, I, I will, towards the very end of it, give you a little bit on, on COD itself or also the technology partners for this particular webinar. Some of these concerns are addressed. But I think Lomesh, you had a question on the IF guideline. Sorry. That's right. Yeah, not the IF guideline. In fact, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. K.J. Raghavan on the IT Act itself. In fact, I see there are some questions asked uh, by the audience itself on whether there should be an amendment to the IT Act or the Arbitration Act uh, with regard to holding the video conference. So let me just give a context 
relates to the whole uh, question that I'm asking. Uh, now, the post-COVID period, it's reopened partially, and the moment arbitral uh, institutions open up, uh, there could be some provide for a video conference. They may actually oppose the idea of having uh, either cross-examination, trial, or further conduct of arbitrations through uh, the video conferencing itself. Do you see that as a challenge, or do you see any way out in terms of uh, analysis of uh, any of the problems? Firstly, Section 19 of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act empowers the parties to determine the rules of procedure. Now, if you read the provisions of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, there is no bar in the Act to record evidence or conduct the whole of the arbitration by video conferencing. The question is, does it require consent of the parties in order to have technology as part of arbitration proceedings? Is it necessary that both the parties must consent that evidence shall be recorded in on a, a digital platform or that arguments can be done in a virtual manner? My view is that there is no need for consent. Even if parties do not agree, section four of the Information Technology Act makes it clear, according to me, that anything which is mandated to be done on paper is validly done if it is done on an e-platform. If you will look at section four, and section four, interestingly, has a non obstante clause also. It says, where any law provides that information or any other matter shall be in writing or in the typewritten or printed form, then notwithstanding anything contained in such law, such requirement shall be deemed to have been satisfied if such information or matter is rendered or made available in an electronic form or accessible so as to be usable for a subsequent reference. So this provision, according to me, is a wide enough provision which entitles an, an arbitrator to say, well, I'm going to conduct virtual hearings. I am not going to depend upon your consent. This is my view of how notwithstanding to two parties not agreeing, still the law empowers an arbitrator to say, I will conduct it virtually. So I think- And sorry. I think we should introduce section four in a broad manner consistent with the object of an arbitration, namely saving time and saving costs. Sir, I think that's an excellent point. Uh, section four of the IT Act, I have also read it uh, very carefully. And I think that really seems to be an answer to quite a lot of uh, the discussions that we're having today. Uh, so, I mean, an argument could be made that even if the arbitral institution rules do not provide for recording of evidence or going virtually, you can always argue that if anything, by virtue of law itself, if something has to be transferred into writing, it is good enough if it is in the digital form. So I think we'll have to just wait and see if uh, the Karnataka Arbitration Center and the other arbitration uh, centers uh, really caters to uh, you know, the demands of uh, the litigants to have proceedings virtually, relying on Section 4 of the IT Act. Uh, if the other participants uh, do not have any further comments on this, I just have a follow-up question. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I think Mr. Hola. Remember, earlier, recording of evidence in handwriting was prescribed. The Act you know, continues to have that. Courts have interpreted to me, I mean, to say that even typewriting is, you know, is permissible. Therefore, I'm sure in course of time, Section 4 Arbitration Act, they will uh, interpret it in a manner that, you know, even the arbitrator without the consent of parties can record evidence. I'm sure of that. It's a question of time. Right, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Raghavan, as a follow-up question, uh, the post-COVID period, it is likely that a lot of parties may take challenges on procedural fairness to say that they did not get a right of proper hearing before the arbitral tribunal in the light of the fact that, uh, you know, everything went online. As a, as a defendant in an arbitration proceedings, you are likely to take all kinds of challenges. How do you perceive such a challenge by one of the defendants to say that uh, they did not get a right of uh, proper hearing before uh, the arbitral tribunal by virtue of uh, things having gone virtually in that sense, or where the arbitral tribunal insists that everything has to go virtual? 
my answer to that lomesh would be that the person making the grievance has to show that there was a prejudice so if merely because something was done online and not physically there was a virtual hearing and not a physical hearing that by itself is not a ground for challenge at all unless one is able to make out that the principles of natural justice have suffered on account of a virtual hearing and i do not see any circumstance where it can be said that by virtue of use of technology there is a compromise in the compliance with the principles of natural justice and ultimately what governs is section 18 equal treatment of the parties if one party's witness is compelled to be cross examined virtually on a e platform while the other witness is allowed to be done physically there may be a ground for grievance that we were not treated equally if that doesn't happen and there is no prejudice the simple fact that a witness was cross examined not physically but on a e platform i don't think is going to be a ground under section 34 at all that's my view do any other yeah i think justice ravindran you see uh, uh, mr holla referred to the direction of the supreme court by the 6th may order saying that as far as examination of witnesses is concerned it shall not be done by uh, video conferencing now if that order continues and though it is applicable to court proceedings i am sure that people will use that order to challenge uh, you know any procedure that happens i think we should wait for that that's a kind of a interim order i am sure that order will come to an end within a uh, short time we should wait for that order to go until that order of the supreme court holds the field that is the law declared by the supreme uh, supreme court it is binding on everyone and uh, very few arbitrators will be willing to uh, you know overlook that order but i agree i totally agree that you know you have to do it in a very very um, uh, slow and steady manner first you tell the arbitrators let us do the preliminary hearing and this case management conference in this then you say all right let us do the uh, small uh, hearing of the application then you say one small witness let us do it you know before the arbitrator knows you know he, he would have totally changed but if you first tell him look here everything should be done lawyers don't agree parties don't agree uh, arbitrators don't agree but kind of you know slip it in slowly and steadily and people will uh, think you know they will agree i am sure it will it is going to be the order of the day but i have one thing to say justice ravindran has not forgotten his lawyering days and that is how he virtually regaled the judges and got orders and uh, he still remembers the lawyering days he is one of the greatest judges that we have and one of the greatest arbitrators correctly said by mr ramesh do any other panelists have any thoughts or comments on this sapna do you have any perspective from uh, singapore in that sense about how the institutions are dealing with this uh, current issue so so you'll have to forgive me i've had technical issues for the last 5 minutes i've only just rejoined you <laughs> So. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I mean, we're just discussing in terms of uh, you know how the institutions can proceed uh, virtually. Uh, uh, you know, when the rules don't provide for it. That was a discussion some time back. Would you want to throw some light on that? Well, in my experience, actually, uh, many of the rules specifically provide that hearings can be um, specifically by telephone conference, and I'm sure it wouldn't be a stretch. for them to be interpreted to provide for virtual hearings i'm pretty sure the siac rules provide that uh, and if i'm not mistaken the lcia and hkiac so i suppose they've thought ahead and had these provisions for a while mainly to save costs particularly for shorter hearings right thank you sapna
Vikas, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, everyone. I think you know, we, we maybe change course a little bit now and start thinking about the future a little bit and, and, and you know, get some views from the panelists on some of the questions we have in that regard. The first one is, you know, just in terms of the crisis itself, there's obviously going to be a lot of challenges. There's going to be a lot more litigation, certainly, uh, and arbitration also. How do we deal with this deluge of cases that are likely to come? Is it time for us to start looking at a wider pool of arbitrators? Uh, maybe, sorry, maybe I will address that question first to, uh, you know, first to Mr. Raghavan and then maybe to Mr. Holla and then Mr. Ravindran. Uh, you have to repeat the question. I, I, I missed it. Sorry, sir. I was saying, with the deluge of cases that are likely to come as a result of the COVID crisis, including the number of arbitrations, should we start looking at increasing the pool of arbitrators than we have currently and start looking at more younger arbitrators, advocate arbitrators? Is that desirable? And if that is, then how do we go forward? I would uh, say yes. I would, in fact, my view has been that we should have younger arbitrators from a larger section, not only judges, lawyers, but domain experts must be arbitrators so that the issues are addressed in a proper manner in, before the arbitral tribunals. Therefore, COVID or no COVID, my view is that we should have a larger pool of arbitrators, qualified arbitrators. Not necessarily qualified in law, but qualified in the field where the dispute has arisen. Sure. That will make it faster. Of course, they need a little bit of help on the legalities, on certain procedural aspects. That, of course, can be supplemented by the lawyers who can help the arbitrator and guide him as to how he or she should conduct the arbitration in a manner known to law. Sure. So maybe, sir, with that, I'll probably uh, pose the question next to uh, Mr. Holla, which is, Mr. Raghavan talked about certain skills that you, the younger lawyers will need to act as arbitrators. In your view, which are the top two or three skills that younger lawyers will need to start picking up to become competent arbitrators, sir? First of all, let me honestly tell you, we had one arbitration where one young lawyer, of course, he was a senior counsel like uh, Ms. Uh, Jangyani. He became an arbitrator. Looking at the witness after three hearings, he, get, he got so bored. He said, I'm no longer wanting to be an arbitrator. Resigned and started uh, <laughs> practicing as a lawyer itself. So one thing is, you know, patience. It requires enormous amount of patience. And I'm sure we, as lawyers, we needle the judges and the arbitrators very much. And uh, therefore, one needs patience. Second is the ability to comprehend. You know, when you have patience and you have the uh, ability to listen to people, you know, you will uh, understand much better because there are two sides to the same coin. Secondly, some little domain, I mean, some little knowledge of law would be needed. It's not, you know, raw juniors you know, who can be arbitrators somebody who has some knowledge of the subject matter. I'm sure, you know, they will make better lawyers, I mean, better arbitrators. So patience, the knowledge of uh, the uh, nature of the subject matter. And thirdly, more than anything else, you know, this is what I've always said, humility. If you have humility, you learn everything. So three things, if uh, I'm sure, you know, no, it's not that, see, we have young lawyers, like Jangyani, we also have young lawyers in uh, Karnataka who have become senior counsel. So we have good talent. It's only a question of time. Secondly, they earn better as lawyers than as arbitrators. So, so <laughs> that's another thing. Uh, well, this is what I feel. Sure. No, thank you, sir. That, that's incredibly insightful. And maybe with that, I will ask Justice Ravindran the, the tougher question, which is, if we agree that younger arbitrators are necessary and we agree that, you know, there are some skills they can pick up, how do we actually ensure that they can become arbitrators? Because as we see currently, particularly in Bangalore High Court, in the list of arbitrators maintained, there's hardly any younger arbitrators. 
lawyers are probably very reluctant to suggest younger arbitrators because you know the clients might feel like they are not experienced enough so how do we overcome this barrier and implement it in practice see the entire problem uh, uh, can you hear me can you uh, yeah the entire problem arises because you are trying to use the word younger stop using that you see you you say a knowledgeable person you see age has nothing to do with knowledge age has nothing to do with experience a lawyer who is uh, who has been exclusively practicing in arbitration let us say put in 500 hours if he is only 30 he is better than a 70 year person who has put in only about 300 hours as a, uh, in arbitration therefore don't link it to young and old but i would say you put it persons with knowledge persons with domain uh, uh, knowledge or experience anybody can be the arbitrator second thing now if young means what young is comparative you know uh, in our days young used to be 20 years and uh, 60 years used to be really doddering old age now at 74 i think i am middle aged uh, therefore uh, young has got different connotations and particularly for lawyers as uh, uh, mr holda said some may not be having the patience to be the arbitrators some may not be accepted by parties because they look young therefore uh, we, instead of saying Uh, yeah, how to encourage young uh, lawyers how i would put it let us have a wider pool of arbitrators let not old retired judges only be arbitrators let young lawyers let active lawyers become arbitrators let you know technic uh, technically qualified persons there are you know uh, for example in in the construction industry infrastructure industry the engineers are so so much knowledge they have with a little uh, you know uh, picking up a little law they can be wonderful arbitrators the chartered accountants there are many chartered accountants now there are uh, economists you know there is no end at all only thing is they should come in let us make it as wide as possible so long as people who come in do not forget that justice has to be done and many a time i tell you some people come in with a axe to grind if you are a active lawyer if you are a active chartered accountant you come here and you hope oh let us see whether i may be getting some work after this arbitration uh, uh, because i am in active practice so this is also a, a reality one of the reasons retired old judges are asked to be arbitrators is not because they are competent they are not going to ask for other work they are not practicing lawyers but if there are i know in london for example that there are so many arbitrators who are practicing lawyers and who are doing who are better than many of the judges very experienced very good therefore i would say that let let it be open but let it be open to persons with knowledge and persons with experience that's all i would say thank you so that's very helpful lomesh over to you thank you so much so just to take a cue from what all the panelists said i think uh, the panelists uh, all agree that there is a need to conduct the arbitration efficiently we speak about younger arbitrators obviously there would be some help and guidance that they would require and uh, that is where really the iif guidelines uh, come in because the iif guidelines as gap of course gave the introduction right in the beginning it is to cater to ad hoc arbitrations where a lot of arbitrators may not have any idea about how to really go about conducting an arbitration so in this regard may i just request uh, the views of uh, uh, justice ravindran and uh, sapna on this and i invite uh, comments from uh, mr kg raghavan also on this as to what are the uh, thoughts and comments uh see your uh, guidelines say the indian arbitration forum best practices guidelines for conduct of arbitration proceedings these are guidelines for arbitrators i would be happy if you next come out with guidelines for arbitration practitioners which is you see if you are thinking of young lawyers if you are thinking of uh, you know 
making them converting into efficient practitioners in the arbitration field you should have guidelines for uh, not only for arbitrators but also for young practitioners that would be uh, one thing the second thing you should tell them is don't be like the old arbitrators and don't be like the old arbitration practitioners what is happening is now you file 20000 pages of documents at the time of arguments you refer to 200 pages now why not file 20000 because you have to have all documents on record there is absolutely no doubt about it therefore file 20000 documents in uh, let us say electronically file only the 200 page document which you are going to rely upon ultimately in a hard copy form make it simple so that it is quicker if you make a simple case complicated what can be completed in one year takes five years if you make a complicated case simple even a complicated case can be disposed of in one year if you can drill this into the mind of the the new uh, set of practitioners and arbitrators saying that be quick be reasonable and always have the cost factor and time factor in mind i'm sure that uh, the arbitrators will be able to do wonderfully well and the arbitration practitioners also will be able to do well this is my view thank you so much justice ravindran those are excellent suggestions uh, in fact the iif committee is also here on the call so we have taken due note of your suggestion thank you so much sir uh, over to you sapna what are your thoughts and comments well, firstly, can I say that it was uh, great to have the opportunity to review the IAF guidelines before this webinar. They're an excellent piece of scholarship, and I think the committee are to be commended on producing such a compendium of best practices internationally. So I think they're excellent. I suppose the only caveat I would have is that um, I would not want any guidelines for arbitration to be followed slavishly or too prescriptively. Um, and I suppose that the answer that may be given to me um, is the same that was given when I said to an Indian lawyer recently that I thought that um, perhaps it wasn't such a good idea to embody in statute the IBA guidelines on conflicts of interest because they're meant to be soft law, they're not to be not meant to be prescriptively embodied in statute. And the answer given to me was, well, actually in other jurisdictions that may be appropriate, but in India, it's really important that we do have um, these guidelines actually given statutory recognition. So I suppose the same argument may be made in relation to the IAF guidelines that in India, there is a real gap and a real need for them. Whereas uh, perhaps in other jurisdictions, um, where there is perhaps um, um, more a hub, more of a hub of international arbitration best practice, you may not need such a compendium. But I suppose um, the only advice I would have would be that I hope that we grow in India a body of knowledge where um, parties and tribunals are able eventually to consider what is the uh, most appropriate procedure for the particular arbitrate, the particular dispute at hand, because in my view, that's really one of the most fantastic things about arbitration. It's the flexibility inherent in the procedure where you don't have very prescriptive rules. Um, and so I've never been a fan of having a very long model procedural order number one, which the tribunal sends out as soon as it's appointed, because um, I think those documents are very useful, but I personally feel it's more useful first for there to be a discussion between the tribunal uh, and the parties to consider and be very thoughtful about what would be a, a very appropriate procedure before procedural order number one is circulated. So um, in short, I think these are excellent guidelines. I hope that they will encourage best practice in India, but I hope that um, they do not discourage thoughtfulness. And just one very small example of that is that um, I do note that there is a, um, a real encouragement to adopt a memorial style pleadings in the guidelines. I think many arbitrators do prefer that, um, but I don't think there should be any kind of assumption that that is always going to be most appropriate. I have had experience uh, where I do think, in fact, 
um, sort of um, a non-memorial style of procedure is more appropriate. Thank you, Sapna. Uh, can I bring in Mr. Uday Hulla and Mr. Keji Ragon if they have any comments on this? My feeling is that, you know, you have to reduce it. It is too lengthy a guideline is my impression. I may be wrong, but then if you look at it, it runs into 40 pages. Can you reduce it so that it's easier for an arbitrator? See, please understand this is as far as judges, judge arbitrators are concerned, they don't require these rules because principles of natural justice is ingrained into them. And procedures, well, they are uh, familiar with it. It is meant for those arbitrators whom you are wanting to bring in, the engineers, the chartered accountants, the domain experts. So don't you think that it is too lengthy a one? I don't know, I may be wrong, but then that was my feeling. Otherwise, it's uh, excellent as... Uh, Ms. Jangiani said, you know, yes, it's an excellent piece of work, but then if you can reduce it, make it more, uh, 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 you know, I, I've always said this, pre-C writing is needed in writing, so also is it needed in arguments. You have to be precise, concise, and short. That's when, you know, judges eat out of your hands. So if you can reduce it, that's my feeling, please. Thank you. I'm so, sorry if I you. said this. No, no. Not at all, sir. Thank you so much for your comments. As I say, brevity is the soul of wit. We'll certainly keep that in mind, sir. Thank you. Mr. K. Jiragwan? Uh, I have only one observation that I want to make. While I share the view of my friend, Mr. Hala, that it should be brief, I just want you to please look at one aspect. I notice that uh, there are provisions made for examination of expert witnesses and also for hot tubbing. That, in fact, hot tubbing is a very uh, rarely adopted practice in India. But one thing that happens, which I've noticed in my experience, especially when we come to complicated and intricate construction and engineering con uh, uh, disputes, you have two questions. One is liability, the other is quantification. Now on quantification, we find the evidence, in fact, most of the evidence that is led before the arbitrator in a, a construction or engineering contract is on quantification of damages. And that becomes very complicated. Therefore, may I suggest that you examine as to whether you can provide that the arbitration can be divided into two parts. One is to decide on the entitlement and leave the quantification aspect of it to be decided subsequently, maybe by a panel of experts who can then submit a report to the arbitrator. That possibly will make it more efficient. And it's so complicated to get into these nitty gritties of how much delay has cost how much. This cost, time cost analysis is a very, very intricate science, which a lawyer or a judge will find it difficult to fathom. Therefore, I think it would be a great idea if you can consider leaving the second part of it to experts who can submit a report to the arbitrator and the entitlement aspect of it, which is more based on contractual terms and law can be decided by the arbitrator. Right. So that's an excellent suggestion, sir. So we've taken note of that as well. I think Justice Mr. Ravindran wants to say something. Yeah. Mr. Lomesh, um, the point raised by Mr. Holla about the size of the guidelines, um, you see, it can be solved by one simple uh, act, that is preparing a table of contents. You, What it misses is the table of contents. If there is a list of one page where what each article says, then it can be 48 pages or even 60 pages. When it is 60 pages or 50 pages and you don't have a table of contents, you feel that uh, it is lengthy. But it is not lengthy. Actually, it is not lengthy when compared to the rules of uh, international institutions, it is uh, quite uh, the size, uh, this much is required. But I also felt that if it had a table of contents, the problem which uh, uh, Mr. Holla mentioned will not be there. 
this is the first thing the second thing is there is a basic difference between indian and international arbitrations in indian arbitrations the arbitrators do the liability issue and the quantum issue also without the assistance of experts whereas in international arbitrations the liability issue is done by the 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 arbitrator i would say the uh, the judicial expert either judges or lawyers and for the purpose of quantum they take the assistance of experts they get a common report or hot tubbing all this is done and ultimately the job of the arbitrator is to go by whether the uh, the the experts report is reasonable and award damages what is happening in india is different judges and lawyer arbitrators who have absolutely no idea about the technical aspects are required to go into hundreds and thousands of pages of technical material which they find it uh, is very difficult and it is very time consuming if there is some way where you can divide it into liability and quantum and complete the liability part and have the um, you know assistance of experts cost accountants chartered accountants whoever are there for quantification and that it becomes the basis for award of damages i think uh, arbitrations can be really be done cheaper and quicker thank you i think that's an excellent suggestion just as well then we'll give take a note of that as well uh, because i think we may be running uh, slightly short of time yeah. so we may want to go to the last question and maybe take few audience questions as well so over to yeah in fact uh, uh, lumesh what i'll do is i'll just go to the audience question straight because there's clearly a, a trend in them there's about five or six questions on exactly one topic which is tutoring of witnesses and how that can be avoided in a virtual setting uh, maybe uh, mr holla if i can request you to provide your views on that uh, i have some views of myself as well which i'll probably give in the end but sir if you could please let us know risk of tutoring of witnesses how to mitigate that in fact if you look at you know the judgment of uh, justice gurraj and you know which i spoke about the uh, 20th century fox i did you know mention it to you what he suggested was that you know when you have examination of a witness cross examination of a witness he may be say in uh, us possibly a representative you are should be there so that he is not uh, you know you you prevent you know any tutoring of uh, the witness or a any assistance being taken by him with the use of uh, say either a computer or a ipad or something like that this is one aspect the other is supposing you know it is not possible for your representative to go to us possibly you can request a counsel there to assist you to be there present in uh, the uh, very room where the witness uh, is to be examined in fact uh, this is ravindran has recently you know sent us in another arbitration where he is arbitrator has sent us you know guideline as to in what manner the cross examination has to take place he has suggested in fact the the respondent side said that look you know how do we uh, prevent you know we would like to be present he said yes undoubtedly you are entitled to and you must he said so th that is uh, one way of uh, preventing it the second is well being uh, uh, <laughs> being present personally which is on uh, online you know the only way is you know that you know some representative or should be present that's the only way you can prevent uh, justice ravindran if you've uh, given some guidance we would also love to learn from you sir any thoughts you had on this question of witness tutoring no the see witness tutoring is a serious concern as far as uh, uh, you know the uh, evidence being recorded uh, online through video conferencing the only solution as mr holla mentioned is make one of your representative to be present in that room to ensure that uh, no hocus pocus takes place and uh, no documents are uh, slipped in or answers are slipped in that's all except that uh, yes you see what happened was uh, in the case uh, where uh, mr raghavan was there the witness was um, in united states i think the other side lomesh arranged for some friend of his or the is client's friend to be present in that room everything went on well there is uh, there is no need for that kind of uh, this thing you see these are commercial dispute please remember these are not uh, disputes between matrimonial disputes or these are uh, disputes in uh, cases of murder or some such thing everything is you have to the, the witness poor fellow he has to look to the document 
if tomorrow he is going to say something which is contrary to the document his evidence is going to be ignored therefore that that kind of you know seriousness yes it is the evidence is relevant necessary but by by just by seeing that one of the uh, opposite sides representative is there the entire problem can be solved so thank you very much for that insight sapna you want to say something please i just want to say this is a a, um, a question that comes up every single time that virtual hearings are discussed and it's clearly something uh, that troubles practitioners very much just to give you an example a couple of years ago i had a case which was heard in singapore and for various reasons one of um, my client's witnesses was based in hong kong and could not travel to singapore now in that particular case it was not feasible to for the um opposing party to send their counsel to hong kong but we did what arbitration practitioners are very capable of doing we were creative we put our hands heads together and we cooperated and we came up with a solution which was endorsed by the tribunal which was that a external third party lawyer from a different law firm so not opposing uh, not the opposing um party's lawyer not my law firm but a complete independent third party lawyer would be present in the room at the same time that the witness was giving their evidence this person would help perhaps with the physical bundle of documents if the witness needed any assistance um and um everybody trusted this third party lawyer he um i think completed a declaration about what he would do and um there was absolutely no issues whatsoever so absolutely great if you can have um the opposing counsel or opposing parties representative present but if not there will be creative solutions and there are solutions out there i think there was recently a sole protocol in virtual hearings if i'm not mistaken which specifically proposed solutions for this issue and I, i cannot remember what the solutions were i think it was definitely the presence of a neutral party assisting uh, the witness but there are solutions out there so sure. no thanks apna that's all very helpful in fact the sole protocol like you rightly said has some very useful guidance both from a technology standpoint and in terms of practical guidelines on what to do uh, as codr actually you know this question gets asked to us a number of times we propose two solutions which are a little bit more cost effective but may not be as efficient the first thing is screen sharing of witnesses so if you have a witness share their screen to every one of the participants you know that there's no tutoring coming in from the screen itself which is a big big difficulty because you know you might be sending whatsapp messages on your screen the second solution we propose to parties is to have a second device located about 5 feet away from the witness looking at the witness capturing the environment so that it's uh, it may be not exactly the same as having a person there but it is a definitely more cost viable alternative of achieving the same result so in circumstances where it is probably not practical to do uh, with having a, a physical person there maybe these are a couple of quick fixes that that can be explored maybe with that you know i mean we, we i'll stop speaking uh, if i could request each of the panelists because we've run out of time to maybe spend 30 seconds to a minute and you know just give us some sense of what your views are what tips do you have of how we take arbitration forward in these times so maybe sapna since since you spoke last i I'll, i'll request you to be the first on this uh i think you're on mute sapna sorry thank you um we live in very uncertain times unprecedented times and we still don't know what the future holds i think what is required more than anything is agility and i think the best arbitration practitioners will rise to the challenge of being agile in how uh, disputes are resolved in assisting their clients to achieve their commercial objectives um we've talked today about the challenges of cross examination advocacy through virtual hearings i think we're all going to have to be agile and rise to those challenges excellent thank you very much for that uh, mr raghavan if i could request you to please say the next i think the essential thing is to have a change of mindset i mean this not possible attitude we have to give up as we go along there are going to be problems so we have to be positive and find solutions to problems so a change of mindset i think is basic to adopting technology as part of our life 
thank you sir for those very insightful words uh, mr holla if i could please request you to speak next my own feeling is that everybody will now uh, uh, become tech savvy lawyers you know have already started in fact thanks to covid 19 there have been hearings all across the country in india online in the high courts and also in the trial courts therefore i'm sure lawyers will catch up it's a question of time we will uh, all the lawyers in a fraternity especially those who are practicing on the arbitration side will become uh, will agree to the online arbitrations thank you very much for that sir justice ravindran uh first is we should have a arbitration bar which is totally missing in india in india what is happening is every lawyer who practices in court wants to come to arbitration after finishing the uh, court work that is not going to help arbitration there should be a committed arbitration bar number 1 and you should widen the base of arbitrators the only the system of uh, uh, old um, judges retired judges being arbitrators should change let lawyers come in let domain expert come in let everybody come in everybody let them uh, contribute and make arbitration really uh, a thriving uh, uh, solution uh, adjudicatory forum third is whether they are lawyers or whether they are arbitrators discipline integrity and hard work if they show that they can give and you see there are cases the kind of cases that are taken up in arbitration the courts just do not have the time to take those cases if you if you have to go to a court with 10000 documents 20000 documents with hundreds of cases where will which court will have the time it is the arbitration that can uh, help there uh, but let us make it uh, reasonably uh, I, i i would say the cost it should be cost effective it should be done in time at it should be done efficiently then it will be a success thank you so thank you very much for those words it was an extremely enlightening session certainly for me and i'm sure the participants will agree i thank every one of you sir justice ravindran and mr uday holla mr raghavan sapna for taking time out of you know very busy schedules to you know to assist us with this all of the participants are extremely grateful sir your talk your point on the arbitration bar in fact one of the foundational principles of the indian arbitration forum is to encourage that and hopefully you know your words plus some guidance with from seniors like you will take us a long way in that direction i also like to thank uh, acudr which is provided the technology support of which i'm also a part so when you're talking about zoom and webex i would also like to say that cudr has a virtual hearing platform which not only provides the video conferencing but also online uploading of documents so that everything in the arbitrations there start to finish so i would encourage people to also uh, you know explore those options uh, when they have some time but which with that i that? think I'll... which one so this is the center for online dispute resolution oh. maybe okay. post this i will reach out to you with some details yeah. on that sir Uh, but i thank everyone here for their time and all the participants for their patience and extremely pertinent questions we look forward to speaking to everyone soon thank you everyone thank you very much